the Honourable Yorn Sibmer. And members, I remind the House that this is uh, an inaugural speech and the normal court courtesies will apply. The Honourable Yorn Sibmer. Thank you, Mr Acting President. And uh, may I offer my congratulations on your appointment to this role and also through you, uh, my congratulations to the Honourable Kate uh, Doust on her historic election. I also offer my congratulations to all members elected here, especially those like me elected for the first time. I'm humbled to be elected to this chamber and I thank the people of the North Metropolitan Region for giving me the opportunity to represent them. I pledge not to let them down. Nothing in my family origins predetermined my presence here. At the end of the Second World War, my grandfathers had occasion to express thanks for their personal survival and embark on separate journeys that would deposit them half a world away on a wharf not far from here. William Hay served as a Royal Navy Submariner in every operational theatre of that conflict. It was on shore leave in Perth that he met his future wife, Bernice Berry. It was love that eventually brought William to settle in Perth and to raise five children, among them my mother Susan, who's in the gallery here today. Frederick Sibmer, my other grandfather, spent the war as an indentured labourer in Germany. He was spared the worst of what happened at home in the Netherlands. My grandmother Elizabeth, who is still with us today at the age of 93, survived that Nazi occupation, married Frederick, had three children in quick succession, and then moved here. <coughs> Only in their later years did my grandparents begin to open up about their wartime experiences. This was not unusual for a generation who collectively kept their own counsel and who had, as children of the Great Depression, developed a level of resilience and gratitude that will always keep me humble. What I will say is that each suffered a terrible loss, no less the loss of their youthful innocence, but they were brave and that they continued to be brave their entire lives. Australia in the early 1950s beckoned as a place where enterprising people could easily get work, put the past behind them and forge new and prosperous lives. My father, Sheward, also here today, came to Australia as a boy with his parents, brother and sister. Legend has it that he spent the majority of that long sea voyage tethered to a railing or some other fixed object due to his mother's mortal fear that he and his two other siblings would be washed overboard. Providence ensured that the family arrived safely. Frederick's renowned impatience determined that the journey terminated at Fremantle rather than Melbourne as originally planned, and I thank him for his foresight. <laughs> I come to this place with the intention to honour their memory. As working class migrants, I hope that they will be proud of their eldest grandson for making it here. My father was until February this year an engineer with the Water Corporation for 45 years. He worked on just about every major initiative and project undertaken by the Water Corp since the mid-1970s. In his final years there, he was responsible for commissioning our two water desalination plants. I respect my father's concrete contribution to this state and the depth of his technical knowledge. He was rightly proud of what he did for a living, and I still, to this day, hear an echo of his admonishment, there's nothing wrong with the water I make, son, whenever I open a bottle of water. My mother is a woman of many talents. There was not a job she could not do well. She taught piano to just about every child who lived north of Scarborough Beach Road for more than 20 years. Coming home from school each day, we were greeted by a wall of sound, as well as a set of precise instructions regarding when and how we were to assemble the dinner that she preferred earlier in that day. In middle age, Mum was finally convinced that she had a good brain and enrolled at university. She's now a clinical psychologist and businesswoman. We are all immensely proud of her achievements and example. My brother Kurt and sister Liesl and I enjoyed a happy and supportive childhood in Corrine. 
We each attended Kareem Primary and Kareem Senior High Schools, which were then and remain now excellent schools. My teachers nurtured a love of learning in me from an early age, and I am grateful for them all. At the time my parents bought the land, Kareen was still a relatively new subdivision, full of young families aspiring to make their way. Very quickly the suburb became established, benefited from good roads, thriving small businesses, a vibrant community and sporting life, and soon exuded a steady suburban and mainstream character. Those qualities continue today in the broad constituency of the North Metropolitan Region. I am here to represent the interests of that mainstream constituency. Regular people who want a fair go to have access to reliable services and to live their lives without bureaucratic interference. I am here for families who worry about paying the mortgage and keeping food on the table. I am here for young people who are worried about how they'll get jobs. I'm here to represent the interests of our seniors who just want to feel safe in their own homes. I'm here to help all my constituents preserve the Western Australian way of life that they love. 75 years ago this week, Sir Robert Menzies spoke about Australia's forgotten people. They were the honest, hard-working, law-abiding people who were neglected by the powerful political interests of the day. They had no one in their corner. Menzies changed that. The idea of a forgotten people might strike us as anachronistic, but it will be my guide here. I will assess every piece of legislation I see in this place against these simple questions. How will it affect today's forgotten people? and how will it benefit families. The people of the North Metro region prefer deeds to words. They are practical and decent people who demand that we in this place get on with our jobs so that they may get on with their lives. I therefore come here as a determined pragmatist who will draw on my skills and experience to serve my electorate and this state so that they might both might have a bright future. Mr Acting President, as a young man with an honours degree in philosophy, I was confronted with an unsurprisingly low number of local job prospects upon graduation. Throughout my studies, I was confronted with the same question, how are you going to get a job with a degree like that? It did eventually dawn on me that local employers weren't particularly intrigued by my dissertation on comparative models of consciousness or the fact that I'd wrestled for 12 months with Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason and survived, a tome that was single-handedly responsible for reducing the size of our graduating honours class from nine to just three students. But at the end of my studies, I left Perth for Canberra as part of the Department of Defence's graduate intake. If I had not taken that journey, I very much doubt that I'd be here today. At Defence, I undertook a broad range of demanding roles which included the development of the East Timor Defence Force, monitoring the Lincoln ceasefire agreement on Bougainville Island, and managing Australia's defence cooperation relationship with Malaysia and participation in the Five Powers defence arrangements. I'll speak only very briefly of my time on Bougainville Island. Bougainville was, prior to its civil strife, home to a population of the most highly educated and skilled populations of the small islands that comprise the South Pacific. In very short order, it disintegrated completely and bore witness to every imaginable war crime. Our job over there was to drive a weapons amnesty between the two ex-combatant groups, groups that still had every reason to despise and mistrust one another. We found that we had inadvertently slowed down that peace process by negotiating exclusively with the old enemies. Only when we started to speak with the churches, women's groups and other civic associations did we begin to see progress. I learned a lesson there about negotiation and the importance of broad stakeholder consultation that I will not forget. The uniformed officers and civilian officials I worked alongside at Defence are among the most outstanding colleagues I have had. 
The example set by then Chiefs of the Defence Force, Sir Peter Cosgrove, Sir Angus Houston and the Departmental Secretary and homegrown Western Australian Mr Rick Smith have set for me the benchmark of leadership in any organisation. My time in defence coincided with the September 11 attacks, the Bali bombings and our campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. The threat of terrorism at home and overseas has informed my global outlook and has shaped my view of what constitutes a united and healthy society. The sickening terrorist attack in Manchester just three days ago has sadly reinforced my perspective. I am the son of a migrant. My wife is the daughter of migrants. And so I am no opponent of immigration. But I can and I will continue to take a deep interest in the success of the National Migration Program. It is something all in our Western Australian community have a stake in. To my mind, the successful integration of new arrivals and encouraging their cohesion within the mainstream are the only rightful objectives of an immigration policy. And I contend that our very welfare depends upon it. On the evening before the WAEC declared that I'd been elected as the sixth and final member of the North Metro region, I'd learned that I'd been appointed as Shadow Minister for Community Services, Youth, Seniors and Ageing, Volunteering, Government Accountability and Veterans Issues. Quite a bag. I just want to make a remark in relation to one of those shadow portfolios, not to the exclusion or detriment of any of the others. With respect to Veterans Issues, I'd like to work constructively with the Minister for Veterans Issues, whose military service to this country I greatly respect, to ensure that the needs of Western Australia's veterans are at the forefront of our considerations. I'm energised to meet the needs of our younger veterans, particularly in the areas of mental health support and employability. In my 40 years, I've worked as a cleaner, market gardener, kitchen hand and tutor. I've worked in the public service for a mining company, a family-owned property development company and a university. I also spent time serving a political apprenticeship. Amanda Vanstone gave me my first job in politics, for which I'm ever grateful. Amanda was then and remains now the definition of political authenticity. She knew her own mind and spoke it often, even at great personal cost. But she gave me some of the most important political tutelage that I've ever received. Be a straight talker. Working for the member for Cottesloe, the Honourable Colin Barnett, was a study in contrast. It was a privilege to work for him. His integrity and political credibility were the reasons the Liberal and National parties were able to form government in late 2008. He is doubtlessly among the most significant premiers this state is ever likely to see. Mr Acting President, the new Museum for Western Australia will open its doors to the public in 2020. If not for the passion of the previous member for Kalamunda and Minister for Culture and the Arts, the Honourable John Day, whom I served as Chief of Staff, the sod turning ceremony which occurred on Monday would not have happened. The election victory of the Liberal Party in 2013 secured that project's future. It will be the jewel in the crown of Perth's cultural centre precinct, create needed jobs and be a tourism drawcard. I joined the Liberal Party because I am a Conservative. To my mind, conservatism is not an ideology that pursues causes or seeks the attainment of impractical ideals. My working definition is that conservatives apply common sense and shared values to preserve a cherished way of life. Conservatism is founded in the collective wisdom of what has been proven to work. It is a guide to ensure that while our circumstances will change, that our values will be preserved. Conservatism establishes the necessity of personal responsibility, 
and the obligation of individuals to one another and of individuals to the whole. It demands service beyond self. Foremost, our obligations to love and protect one another are enacted through the family, the most cherished and important social institution that we have. So if the purpose of my parliamentary service can be reduced to one objective, it is to ensure that future generations of Western Australians and their families inherit a higher standard of living than my generation enjoys. I am therefore committed to ensuring this state's continued economic development and especially to the continued delivery of critical infrastructure and jobs in Perth's northern suburbs. My starting premise for this is that Western Australia's future success is not guaranteed. In spite of our abundant natural resources and skilled workforce, there is always the risk that we slip into decline. We have no one to rely upon but ourselves. My hope is that Western Australia's best days are yet ahead of it, but we will only get there by our own striving. We are being buffeted by changes, financial, economic, cultural and technological. The residential electricity sector is a prime example of where fundamental changes are already taking place. The proliferation of affordable generation and storage technologies have now upended the century-old model of centralised electricity generation, transmission and distribution. I'm sorry to say that this means that we cannot avoid giving serious consideration to the wisdom of retaining in perpetuity state-owned electricity utilities whose asset values will only decline. I also want to make some mention of the disruption of technological change and how this bears on the delivery of education in this state. What was once science fiction is now science fact. An array of technologies encompassing artificial intelligence, virtual and augmented reality, 3D printing and autonomous and integrated systems are changing our lives already. Industries are being broken, made and remade. All I need to do is remind people of Uber to give a sense of how rapidly change has occurred. I don't take a position on whether all this change is inherently for good or for bad. I suspect it is partly both. What matters, though, is how we respond. My son, who's only seven months old now, will enter a workforce marked by heightened global competition for skills and where human-machine interaction is the norm. A failure to prepare him for that future, and indeed all our children for that future, will be a dereliction of duty. We have an excellent education system in this state, much of it due to the hard work of my colleague, the Honourable Peter Collier. The task remains for us to build on this strong foundation and emphasise the need for comprehensive science, technology, engineering and mathematics education in all our schools. Future generations of school students are going to require a combination of fundamental maths and science knowledge and advanced vocational skills to thrive in the new world. That means we might have to do more to encourage students to take hard maths and science subjects in years 11 and 12. To fail in this will be to consign our children to the status of global academic and economic also-rans. We can't drop the ball on this. So if there's but one achievement I wish to make in my time here, it will be to ensure that future generations of Western Australian children receive the world's best STEM-oriented education so that they are ready to work in smart service industries and niche manufacturing sectors which will provide the next tranche of skilled jobs. The Liberal Party went to the recent election with a $30 million pledge to replace the old state quadriplegic centre in Shenton Park with a new 28-bed facility consistent with modern standards of care for people with spinal injuries, as well as a $13 million uh, grant to provide for the construction of suitable at-home accommodation for those who wish to maintain their independence. I'd like to take this opportunity to urge the state government to match that commitment. My mother's uncle, Paul Berry, was a permanent resident at the old paraplegic quadriplegic rehab hospital in Shenton Park 
until his passing away in 2005. In the late summer of 1956, Paul, then aged 27, was felled by the polio epidemic that gripped Australia. Paul survived, but he did so at great personal cost. He forever lost the use of his arms. The muscles in his torso atrophied to the point where he could not breathe unconsciously. Paul slept every night of the next 49 years in an iron lung. Without its help, he would suffocate. I often think about the promise of his youth that was cut down by a disease that we now have little occasion to remember. He was a gifted athlete, dancer and competitive sailor. He drove fast cars and had a promising career in the family building business. All of that was taken from him, but he was gifted a strong mind and a sense of humour. Gradually, Paul rebuilt a life for himself including teaching himself to type and paint with his toes, eventually teaching an art history class at Tech. He never drew a pension, instead relying on the proceeds of a land sale which he invested wisely. He also supplemented his income through selling his paintings. He maintained a connective, connected and active life, attending mass and watching West Perth play whenever he could. He was often seen dashing across Selby Street in his motorised wheelchair on the way to the Wembley bottle shop. It's quite a sight, I can tell you. He was dearly loved by his family and he is probably the most remarkable person I have ever met. I tell this story in part to honour his memory, but also as a warning about the dangerous propaganda of the modern anti-vax movement. Modern communications has brought with it many positives but pseudoscientific fallacies travel quickly too. We need to be on guard against that. Parents who do not vaccinate their children are not only putting the health of their children in jeopardy, but they are also endangering those whose immune systems are still underdeveloped. And reports of the under-vaccination of children, even in the more affluent suburbs of the North Metro region, are cause for serious alarm and serious action. I therefore very much support the principle of the Commonwealth Government's no jab, no play policy and its implementation in Western Australia. And I pledge to work with colleagues in this place and with health professionals in this state to arrest this decline of vaccination rates. I would briefly like to acknowledge the quiet and groundbreaking research undertaken by our scientists. Perth is home to some truly world-leading researchers and specialists in the field of medical science. We must never take them for granted. While it may be unfair to single out just one team for their work, it is in my opinion that the more people who know about the UWA bioengineering team responsible for the microscope and a needle invention a few years ago, the better. That invention uses advanced optics to detect previously undetectable pathogens. The capacity to identify and locate minute cancer cells will save lives and reduce the need for follow-up surgery. The potential benefits for women with breast cancer are very promising. This kind of wonderful work goes on in this state every day. And while it is the disposition of our adversarial system to focus on problems and shortcomings in public life, I will also use my position here to bring focus to those truly remarkable innovations from which we all will prosper and benefit. I have a great deal of thanks to give. I thank the men and women of the Western Australian Liberal Party who endorsed my candidature last year. The Liberal Party pre-selection meeting for the North Metropolitan Region was a large and competitive affair which attracted a strong field of candidates. To every single one of those people, including my two senior colleagues in this place, the Honourable Peter Collier and the Honourable Michael Mission, and to those colleagues whom I shared the ticket with, Victoria Jackson, Sandra Brewer and Tim Walton, I give my utmost respect and appreciation. The election result belied the pipeline of young talent that we have in the Western Australian Liberal Party. My hope is that this generation is given the opportunity to renew and rebuild, 
and I'm sure that it will. I thank every single member of the Cowan Division for their support and robust advice, especially the magnificently blunt Matthew Blampy, the incomparable Colin and Honourable Cheryl Edwards, who I understand are watching me from Ireland at the moment, Scott Edwards, Rosemary Edgar, Scott and James Edgar, the Honourable Ray Halligan, a respected former member of this place and my campaign chair who also joins us today, Old War Horse John Hammond, Gary McLean, Tess McLean, Amanda McElroy, Lisa Brooks, Ryan Blake, <coughs> Arthur Taylor and Fran Blampy. I would not be here without you. Politics is a competitive and ruthless enterprise. The loss of my friends Eleni Evangel and Paul Miles bears out that fact. They are a loss to this parliament and to their electorates. I thank them both for their friendship and support when they were in the fight of their political lives. It was a pleasure to campaign alongside you. I have benefited also from the support provided by Dr Peter Lilly, Mr Stedman Ellis and Mr Matthew Fay, who each encouraged me to make a serious political run. To my ex-colleagues at UWA, Professor John Dell, Dr the Hon. Elizabeth Constable, David Harrison, Mark Stickles and Tim Shanahan, please know that I appreciated your candour and camaraderie over the prior three years and that I carry with me here many of those ideas and opportunities we discussed for the advancement of the state's tertiary education sector. To Jason Morocchi, Richard Wilson, Blair Stratton, Joey Armenti, Rhys Turner, James Larson, Mike Buber, Simon Ehrenfeld, Aiden, this will go on, Aidan Departsi, Michael Van Marnen, H.M. Curry, Brent Fleeton, Daniel White, Caroline Proust, Stephen Barton, Jin Ang, Andrew Whitehead, Liam Staltari and Anthony Spagnolo. Thank you for your advice and support, even when I didn't always listen. Thank you too to State Director Andrew Cox and the entire Liberal Party headquarters for running a campaign in the most trying of circumstances. That took exceptional courage and you were professional throughout. To my parents Sue and Seward, my brother Kurt and sister Liesl, and to your families, thank you for making me who I am. And to the Hay, Jones, Mockdad, Manise and extended Sibma families, thank you. <coughs> Finally, to my wife Tanya. Thank you for all you have given me, especially our beautiful baby son. Your love, advice and support are immeasurably valuable to me, but your constant reminders that there is a big world outside of politics and your insistence that I continue to fulfil my domestic duties is precisely the guidance I need most. Thank you very much.